Welcome to Grow Money Business, the podcast dedicated to helping business owners grow both their wealth and business on their own terms. Here's your host, Grant Bledsoe. Hello, everybody. Grant Bledsoe here. Welcome back to Grow Money Business. This week on the show, we're talking all about loans and cash. A few weeks back, we refreshed our episode on what to do with extra cash. We talked about the concept of emergency funds. Where do you park it? What are your options with rising interest rates? This week, we're going to talk about an adjacent topic. Where do you go if you need a little bit of cash? Some people like to use their credit cards for this or maybe tap a personal line or a home equity line of credit. I want to talk about all those 401k loans and margin lending a little bit. If you're in the situation where you need a little bit of short-term cash and you'd like to know where to go to get it at the most affordable rate. This is something that does come up frequently. It comes up periodically, I think, for everybody from time to time. Every, every now and then, something can happen that requires a little bit of cash that you didn't anticipate. And in our financial planning practice, we work with enough people to where that's a relatively frequent occurrence. And I thought it would make a lot of sense to cover that on the show today. I hope you enjoy it. Hey, everyone. I need to interject quickly to remind you all that nothing found in today's episode or any other episode of Grow Money Business should be considered financial, investing, legal, tax, fitness, or even relationship advice. It's content that you're free to use and to deploy on your own terms. And before taking any actions on content found on the show, please do consult with your tax professional, your attorney, or your financial planner. If you don't have a financial planner, head on over to threeoakswealth.com to learn more about what we do in terms of financial planning and investments and how we help clients on an ongoing basis. So today we're talking all about cash. Let's say that something happened to where you need cash, or maybe you're at a position where you're making a little bit more money, you're trying to pay off some credit card balances or maybe some debt that you have in your business, and um, it's high interest rate debt, and, and may, well, well, what, what should I do with that? Is, is a different kind of loan, uh, does that make sense? Should I take money out of my house with the, through a HELOC maybe to pay off this short interest rate debt? What about a 401k loan or a personal line? There are some options out there to restructure debt to your advantage. And today, that's, that's what we're, what we're going to talk about. So the, the, the major source of, of funds, sources of funds I want to talk about are 401k loans, personal loans, credit, personal loans and credit cards. I'll lump those together. HELOCs, home equity lines of credit, or cash out refinances uh, would, would be in that bucket as well. And margin loans on taxable uh, securities accounts. Sometimes these can make sense. Sometimes they don't, uh, as is true of most things, fi uh, personal finance. And today, I, I thought it would just make a lot of sense to go over the specifics in case you're in a position where you need a lot of cash. Interest rates are a little higher now than they were over the previous uh, many years. And it's just getting a little more expensive to borrow money. We want to scrutinize this. So let's let's take a hypothetical scenario. Let, let's say that you've got $50,000 of short-term debt from whatever. Um, personal spending or business activities and you're you're wondering if taking out a different kind of loan at a lower rate to pay off that high interest rate credit card would make sense. Most credit cards are going to charge you as you know probably between 15 and like 23% per year and this can make sense in that scenario because that's a that's a really really high interest rate. So <clears throat> personal loans, why don't we start there? Personal loans are issued through uh, banks. They're issued through uh, often the same company that might underwrite your credit card. And it's basically a replacement. If, if you're going to take out a personal loan to pay off a credit card, then it's uh, replacing a revolving line of credit with a, a fixed line of credit to where with, with the credit card, you go to the grocery store, you flash the credit card, you can buy stuff, and then you pay back the bank later. A personal loan is it basically consolidates credit cards. It doesn't give you that ability to put uh, to add to the balance and take more money out at will. You are agreeing to pay it off over a fixed period, as opposed to a credit card where you can just make minimum payments and uh, pay off the interest and let the balance grow indefinitely if if you want to. 
So personal loans, because they have fixed amortization schedules, you can you can get them for you know two, three, five, sometimes as long as ten years. You can, you do have some flexibility in the payoff terms, but you are not able to structure them. I've in fact I've I've never maybe it's possible, but I've never seen one. Uh, where you take out a personal line, the bank gives you money that you use maybe to pay off a credit card balance, and then you have the option of only paying off the interest. These things amortize over the defined period that you agree on when you borrow the money at first. So in our our circumstance, if you have $50,000 of credit card debt, your bank is charging you 20% per year to maintain that balance, it may make a lot of sense to approach that bank or maybe a different bank and explore the possibility of taking a personal line, a personal loan. The bank gives you $50,000. You take that and pay off the credit card balances, so you're not paying 20% on that. Instead, you're paying these days, maybe it's, I don't know, call it 8 or 10% perhaps, maybe 10 to 12%, something in that range, per year over a fixed amortization period. So just like a mortgage, if you have a five-year personal loan, every month you are going to make a payment. A portion of it is going to be interest. A portion of it is going to be principal. And the amount of the, uh, amount of the payment is whatever is required to work the, ba- the $50,000 balance down to zero by the end of the term, by the end of the five years. And so if they're going to charge you a rate of 10%, the monthly payment is simply a plug number of whatever you need to do to get that balance to zero after the five years. So a personal loan is uh, a reasonable way to go. If you're in a position where you're comfortable making those monthly payments and don't ever have any ambiguity surrounding, well, you know, next month might be a little bit thin. I'm not sure if I can actually pay off principal. I might just need to pay off interest. If you have confidence that you can make that monthly payment that's going to be consistent and fixed through the life uh, life of the loan, then this makes sense. You approach the bank, you take out a personal line, you're agreeing to make monthly payments, but in exchange for that, they give you the cash to pay off the credit card. And now you've you've effectively cut your interest rate in half, which is good, right? And that's That makes a lot of economic sense. You're, you're, you're reducing your interest rate and a lot less money is going to the bank and a lot more is going to stay in your pockets. Now, if you're not sure whether you can uh, pay back the, the principal on those terms, then that's probably not a good idea. (laughs) An alternative might be a HELOC. HELOCs are a little bit more flexible. When we bought our house, in fact, we we bought it with a a, a combination of a conventional mortgage and a HELOC. We're almost done paying the HELOC off. But we do have the flexibility of making interest-only payments should we want to. The downside is that most HELOCs are going to have an adjustable rate and... If we're in an environment like we're in now, rates go up. That means that your your interest uh, carry is going to go up as well. But the benefit is that most of them don't have a fixed amortization schedule where you have to pay it off uh, or, or each payment is a portion of interest and principal. You can make interest-only payments if you want. Um, some of them have interest only payments for a couple of years and then the uh, a fixed amortiza- amortization will apply thereafter there there are uh, a number of ways that these things are drawn up but they give you more flexibility the downside obviously is when you take out a heloc you're taking money out of your house right this is your your a personal loan has no collateral or I should say that the collateral is your personal ability and willingness to repay that loan. If you don't, let's say you default on it, you just stop making the payments because you're frustrated with the bank. Well, you default on the debt. You're going to have a hard time getting another loan, but there's no collateral involved. They're not going to come and take your car or take your house. And the beauty of this, if you're, if, if that's truly an issue is that this kind of debt doesn't stay on your credit report forever. It's on there for seven years and then it goes away. So you've, you, you do have a little bit more um, responsibility with the HELOC. You have more flexibility too, because you can adjust your payments down. And in some circumstances, providing the loan allows it, 
make interest only payments if you need to. The downside is that you're borrowing against your house. And if you get frustrated with the bank and decide to stop making payments, they're going to come and they're going to take it from you and, and foreclose. So th- th- there's more responsibility. You're probably going to get a better rate on a HELOC than you are on a personal line these days. Both of those are going to come at lower interest rates than, than credit cards. So those are, those are reasonable options. Sometimes people uh, want to entertain 401k loans too. And 401k loans can, can make sense if you have um, a 401k plan at work, or maybe you own a business and sponsor one yourself. 401k plans are not required to be structured to allow loans, but many of them do. It's a nice feature to have for people to give them access to their funds if they really need it, uh, really need them in a pinch, but they come with a lot of strings. So let's say you work somewhere where you have a 401k that allows you to borrow from it uh, when you need to. There's a limit on the amount of money that you're going to be able to take out. And it's, it's uh, usually you, you can't take more money out than you have in the 401k plan, number one. But there's also a federal limit. I think it's $50,000. You can't have more than uh, $50,000 of outstanding loans at any one time. If you were to go down this road, you contact your 401k administrator, ask for help taking out the loan. The administrator is going to charge you a fee for that transaction. Usually it's like 50 to as much as a couple hundred bucks. They send you a check for cash. That cash comes because they're selling investments inside your 401k. So as much as we like to have our uh, savings invested for long-term tax-deferred compound growth, when you take a loan from your 401k, it's not your company cutting you a check and saying, yeah, pay us back later and letting your 401k assets grow. You're taking money directly from your retirement. And so if you take the money out, it's not a taxable event, which is great. And the terms of your repayment are going to depend on how the 401k is structured. Um, Some have a flexible amortization period. Some will require you to pay them back in five years. Others, I've I've seen longer amortization periods, 10 and and even 20 years in some circumstances. So let's let's say that you take the $50,000 out of the 401k to pay off the credit card. And you have a five-year amortization schedule. After you take the loan out, you you get the cash, the administrator of the 401k sends you a check. You take that check, deposit it in the bank, and then use the use the balance to pay off your credit cards, zeroed out your credit card balance. That's great. But you have fifty thousand dollars less in your 401k, so it's not going to be invested for growth. And every pay cycle thereafter, you put money back into the 401k to pay yourself back through payroll. Oftentimes, you don't have any discretion how much is sent back uh, through payroll because it's a fixed amortization. If it's five years, you don't have discretion of, hey, I can only pay back you know, 75 bucks on my loan this month. They may not let you do that. It depends on the terms of the 401k, how it's set up, and what the, what the flexibility features are. Now, let's say that, that you, you pay back $1,000 a month. I'm, I'm pulling that out of thin air. I don't know what the payment would be on a $50,000 loan over five years. You pay yourself interest. And so presumably the money that you put into the 401k initially, you contributed through a payroll deferral. Perhaps your company put some in on your behalf as well. It's probably all tax deferred. You take money out of the 401k through a loan. When you pay yourself back, that's all taxable. So you're foregoing the tax deferral on the money you take out of the 401k through a loan. Here's the killer. You have to pay yourself interest too. And the interest rate is usually set um, as a function of the prime rate. Usually it's prime, I don't know, plus one, plus two, something like that, which these days is going to be at least 7% per year. So it's good that you're you're just paying yourself. You're not paying the bank, which is not the end of the world. But if you borrow $50,000 from your 401k, you're going to pay back a lot more than $50,000. 
the 50 grand that you put in, the principal is going to be taxable as income. And the interest is going to be taxable as income. So you repay yourself the $50,000 plus interest. Both of those are taxable. The problem is that you're not getting a tax benefit from that when you pull the money out in retirement. You're gonna, you will be taxed on it twice. So the 50000 bucks you put in plus the interest is all taxable income. Let's say that you do this when you're 40. You pull $50,000 out, use the cash to pay off your credit cards. Over the next five, t- five years, 10 years, whatever, you replace that $50,000 plus interest with money that was taxed. And then when you're 65, it's time to start taking money out of the 401k again to pay for your retirement expenses. When the money comes out after repaying the loan, that's all taxable income too. So you will be taxed on this twice, once when you repay the loan and uh, plus the interest, and again, when you take the money out in retirement. And if you don't need the money, you don't want to take it out of the 401k or the IRA if you roll it over, the IRS will force you to start doing that once you're in your 70s. They've just pushed back the deadline a little bit, but the money still has to come out because it's been deferred and they want their share of that. They, they want to tax you on that balance. So the 401k loan is a great feature to have. It 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 can work. You know, you're you at the end of the day, you are paying yourself back. You're paying interest to yourself, but during the time that you pay yourself back, between taking the loan and then paying yourself back, you are foregoing tax deferred growth and you will be taxed on that balance twice, which is not ideal. When if you'd have left it in there and found another financing mechanism, you're only taxed on it once. You put the money in, you're not taxed then. It grows, you're not taxed. You're only taxed when you pull the money out down the road. So again, this isn't to discourage anyone from going down this road if if the fact pattern is right, but uh, the the there is adverse tax consequences to doing that. And generally, I like to keep stuff for retirement in retirement. Let that compound growth just work for you and pursue other avenues. The other thing you have to worry about is there are um, features where all that where where one hundred percent of that loan might be due. If you take $50,000 out to pay off the credit cards and then you turn around and quit a month later, you want to repay that loan before you depart. (coughs) And the reason is that if you don't, it's a default on the loan. The entire 50 grand you took out is taxable as income. Plus, if you're not 59 and a half yet, uh, a 10% early withdrawal penalty. And you, there are other circumstances where uh, a loan might be called when you pull from the 401k that are dependent on how your 401k plan is set up. So just make sure that you understand all that stuff. Make sure that you are comfortable with that concept of if you leave, even if it's not your choice, you, you'll, you're you really going to want to pay, down, pay back that loan as soon as you can. Uh, because if you don't, it's going to come with unnecessary taxation and penalties. Now, the last one that I think is often neglected, a lot of people think this is really scary and they don't want to touch it, is a margin loan. Margin loans can, margin loans really work pretty well in a lot of circumstances. A margin loan is one that your brokerage firm extends to you using assets in your brokerage account as collateral. So, there are all sorts of implications of this. Let's let's say you've got a quarter million dollars in a in an investment account that's in your name, meaning that it's taxable. It's not an IRA or a Roth IRA. It's a it's taxable to you. I don't believe margin loans can be extended at all in in retirement accounts like that. So if you have, let's say, the entire two hundred fifty thousand dollars consists of Google stock. Your brokerage firm might be okay after approving you for this, after checking your credit and everything, extending you a margin loan using that Google stock as collateral. 
And based on the value of the shares, they're worth $250,000 today, remember, uh, they'll extend you credit and let you pull cash out of the account. The rate on these things, I was just looking at this uh, for a client, the, the rate that Charles Schwab has on its margin loans right now ranges from, I actually have it up, 8.5% on the low end to around 12.5% on the high end. The more money you have in the account, the more profitable you are to the brokerage firm and the less they're going to charge you in interest. So that's really along the lines of what you get um, in a personal loan for the most part. If you have a maybe a quote uh, for a personal loan for like 18% and you have assets in a taxable account, you, know, you can probably do a little bit better by if you're comfortable pledging those as collateral. But the, again, the big thing here is the stocks in the account are uh, used as collateral. With the personal loan, there is no collateral outside of your ability and willingness to, to pay, back, pay back the bank. So the way this works is, is you get approved for margin first. Usually brokerage firms are going to have a form for you to fill out, uh, and then they'll extend um, the margin opportunity. So if you have a quarter million in Google stock, you're approved for margin. You might be able to pull 50 grand out. You can probably pull more than 50 grand out uh, for um, the purpose of paying down your credit card. And if they're charging you 20% on the credit card, you can, get, you can get 10% on a margin loan. Hey, this starts to look pretty good. Now, <clears throat> a lot of th there are a lot of implications here. It's a risky maneuver to do that. If the value of Google goes up, then that's great. Maybe your two hundred fifty thousand dollars worth of shares is now now worth three hundred thousand. That simply means that you can pull more cash out of the bank or out of your brokerage account on margin, and uh, the broker is going to assess an interest charge against the cash in the bank or the cash that you've withdrawn as a result of that. So that's great. It just gives you more buying power. You can borrow money. You don't have to necessarily have to pull the cash out. You can. Uh, borrow money to buy more shares of Google, and where if you know, whereas if you just had the two hundred fifty thousand dollars invested in Google, maybe you take fifty thousand of cash out and pay off the credit cards, and another fifty thousand uh, you use of margin buying power you use to buy more shares of Google. Well, now if Google goes up, your return on your your return is is going to be greater, not you know, on a percentage basis. Well, yes, on a percentage basis because your equity is is only so much. But it enhances uh, returns long term. In that vein, the downside is that it enhances them uh, on on the negative end of the spectrum too. So if if you have two hundred fifty thousand worth of stock, you take fifty grand out, and then the price of Google gets cut in half. Now you might be in trouble, right? And and if 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 you're borrowing fifty grand. And the price of your investment falls from 250 to 125 grand, you still probably have sufficient collateral in the account where the brokerage firm is not going to be that bent out of shape. I don't know exactly what the margin limits are these days, but if you have 125,000 of, of collateral and you only owe 50,000, that's not really an issue. Let's say that you borrow 200,000 of, of cash to pay off your credit card and then to go buy a Ferrari, and you have $250,000 of assets in the account. Obviously, because your loan balance is larger, they're going to assess you more in interest charges, but you have a $200,000 loan. If the value of your $250,000 investment goes down to $125,000, now the brokerage firm is going to require you to put in more collateral. They're going to want you to give them money back to where your collateral at least matches the outstanding loan. And they're going to want more than more than that, I believe. I, I can't remember what the relationship between how much money you can pull out to um, uh, what your collateral needs to be is. The point is that if the collateral is worth less than your loan, they're going to need you to put up more collateral or they're going to start selling assets in your account to pay back the loan, whether you like it or not. That's where this is tricky. So if you borrow against securities in your account, you're subjecting yourself to the risk that the brokerage firm 
sells the securities when you otherwise don't want to. And this is there. There are a couple implications of that. If the value of your your investment goes from two hundred and fifty to one hundred and twenty five thousand dollars, it's just fallen by twenty by fifty percent. You don't want to sell when it's low. You probably want to wait it out for a rebound with a company like Google. You know, yes, if it's if you think that's going to continue down going down, play the momentum game and get out before it falls further. I, I get that uh, that argument, but big picture, we're trying to buy low and sell high. You probably don't want them selling right after it's fallen by 50%. On top of that, this is a taxable account. So it's going to be a taxable event, whether you like it or not. And yes, if you purchase, if you used 100, uh, excuse me, $250,000 of cash to buy the stock in the first place, and the broker sells you out, which is the terminology here, after a 50% loss, then you have a capital loss on your hands. That's not the worst thing in the world tax wise. But what happens if you put 50,000 bucks in, it went to 250, you want to hang on to this indefinitely so you don't have to pay the capital gains tax, you borrow against it. <coughs> and so you sell, and so the after the price falls by 50%, the broker sells you out, now you have a $75,000 capital gain. Th- those are all implications of taking a margin loan. So if we're going to rank all four of these options, in this situation, you have $50,000 on a credit card couple credit cards or whatever that you want to pay off. You can take a margin loan. You can take a personal loan. You can borrow from your HELOC. You can borrow on a margin loan against securities in your account. I would be hard pressed not to look at a personal loan first because you don't have the provided you're comfortable making the payments. You don't have to put up collateral. It just makes things so much easier. And there's there's so much to be said for keeping things simple and avoiding unnecessary layers of complexity. I can't tell you how many times we've seen people um, layer on complexity unnecessarily to where it's so challenging to unwind. We miss the forest from the trees of what are we really trying to accomplish here? Why do we need all these this, this rat's nest of complexity when the simple solution is, is direct and far easier to implement and far likelier that we'll execute successfully. So I would be hard pressed not to go, not to explore personal loans first. I would then, depending on how comfortable you are, look at a, at a HELOC. Historically, you used to be able to write off the interest on HELOCs, no questions asked. I believe now a HELOC needs to be, in order to write off the interest, I think you have to prove that the that the balance was used for a home purchase or improvement. So if you take out money against your house to pay off a credit card, I think you're going to have a hard time doing that. But that's probably where I would go next. And then after that, it would be uh, really circumstances, depending whether I'd look at a margin loan or a 401k loan first. Both have pros and cons, really depends on the circumstances, what you're trying to do tax-wise to determine which of those might be the best fit. One final note on margin loans is it's there are other implications here too of pledging your stock as collateral, which is what you're doing. You're, you're, you're pledging this. You're, you're saying, I'd like to borrow $50,000. Here's my stock. You can hold on to it on my behalf uh, as collateral for this margin loan. You're, you're pledging it. You don't have to formally, you know, take it and put it into a different account or anything like that. What happens behind the scenes is the brokerage firm may wind up hypothecating those shares. Hypothecating before I entered the industry was not a word that I'd ever heard of in my entire life. But after spending seven years in securities lending, I, it's um, central to how, how that operates. Anytime you go on margin, a brokerage firm by industry rule and by the margin agreement you sign has the ability a right to quote unquote hypothecate up to 140% of your balance. Hypothecating means that they may take you that share and lend it to somebody else or lend it to another brokerage firm. You still own it, but they have the ability to do something else with it behind the scenes. When they hypothecate a stock from you, you don't see anything different in your account. It doesn't disappear from your account. You still own it. 
the value still changes every single day with fluctuations in the market. Nothing else changes. What might change is if that stock pays a dividend while it's by it's been hypothecated. And this gets a little technical, forgive me for that, but if if you borrow money from the broker, they take those shares behind the scenes and lend them to another institution, which brokerage firms do all the time. It's a big profitability driver. And that stock pays a dividend. The brokerage firm it was loaned to has a requirement to send cash to the brokerage firm that lent it to them. So if Morgan, if you have an account at Morgan Stanley, you own shares of Google, they pay a dividend, and your shares of Google were lent to Fidelity for the month or the day or whatever, then if, if there's a dividend paid, Fidelity is going to send cash back to Morgan Stanley to make Morgan Stanley whole for that dividend because Fidelity, uh, as the temporary holder, is the one that receives that cash. So Morgan Stanley takes the cash and they give it to you in your account because you still own the stock. You have a right to the dividend. The problem is that there's a different tax treatment on it. And so if you see anything that's related to payment in lieu of dividend and a gross up payment, maybe they give you a little bit of, a little bit extra, it's because if you hadn't uh, gone on margin and, and your shares had not been lent, Google's dividend would have been treated as a qualified dividend at a, and taxed at a lower rate. But if it was loaned out, it's taxed differently. You don't get those same tax benefits. So they give you a little bit of extra cash in your account to make up for it is basically what it comes down to. Probably not anything you ever needed to know, by the way, but you ought to be aware that if you ever go on margin, that's just part of the gig. They're going to hypothecate your shares if they ever have a need to. Nothing uh, is. It's very likely that nothing is going to appear different in your account. You can pay off the loan and remove their ability to do that. You can sell the shares whenever you want. They're still yours. You get all the economic benefits from it, but that's what's going on behind the scenes. Okay. Um, sorry for diving into the rabbit hole on that one, but um, it, is a, it is a legitimate thing. It's uh, the Margin loans are a heck of a lot lower, inter- have much lower interest rates than short-term revolving debt like credit cards and um, it could be viable in some circumstances. All right. Hope this was helpful. And we'll talk to you all again soon. Thanks for tuning in to Grow Money Business, the podcast dedicated to helping business owners grow both their wealth and business on their own terms. Be sure to subscribe to the podcast on iTunes, Google Play, or wherever you digest podcasts to ensure you don't miss out on future episodes and announcements. And feel free to submit questions to growmoneybusiness.com.